Good morning, Hope Church. Thank you once again for the great joy and privilege of speaking to you all the way from Perth, Western Australia. And this morning, I'm so glad to be able to take this very important subject on work. And let's bow. We have a word of prayer and then I'm going to jump right in. Lord, I thank you this morning for the joy and the privilege of speaking to this amazing group of believers in Hope Church. And I pray that you will use your servant, anoint me so that I may deliver your word with clarity, with simplicity, but also with authority. And may this word just minister to our hearts and cause us to walk away with fresh paradigm in which we can view our work and to recognize that it is really something beyond the pay grade. And so we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I often ask believers this question, why do you work? And the common answer I get would be this, I work for a paycheck or I work for a living. Now, if that is your answer, then here's what I need to tell you. I think this answer, I work for a paycheck or I work for a living, is really true as a statement of outcome, but not necessarily as a statement of purpose. And you would have noticed that I actually ask you a purpose question. Why do you work? Now, it is true that our work would actually result in our sustenance, but we do not work just to get a paycheck. It must be something beyond our pay grade. You know? And the truth is, work is so much a part of our lives that we must be able to find meaning and fulfillment in our work. Because after all, we spend more than 40% of our waking hours at work. Now, this is especially true as we evolve into a, a society that draws our source of identity from our vocation. Uh, for example, we would introduce ourselves, if we are meeting for the first time, we will probably introduce ourselves as, Hi, my name is Benny and I'm a pastor. Right? Uh, very, you will hardly hear anyone say, Hi, I'm Benny and I come from the whole clan. Right? Well, our identity is not tied up as much in our, our, our clan or our surname, but it's often tied up in our vocation. Now, with this as a backdrop, I think let's explore the theology of work in the Bible. Now, I want to suggest to you that there are four biblical perspectives in which we should view our work. And the four biblical perspectives are this. If you were to ask me, Benny, why do you work? And, and by the way, pastors work also, right? So if you ask me, why do I work? I, I'll give you four biblical reasons why I do. Number one, it says, work is a divine command. I work because work is a divine command from God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible tells us this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. In other words, work actually existed before the entrance of sin into this world. Work is not the result of Adam's fall. Work was something that God gave to man in order to occupy our days. And work was commanded by God for man's good, right? The first thing God did after he created Adam, Adam and Eve was to put him in a garden and there he was to work. Now in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 21, the Lord said, as part of his laws, he said, you shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing times and harvest, you shall rest. And I'd like you to notice that the Lord said, you shall work six days. How many of you know that is a command? It's not an option. It is a command. You shall work six days. Now, of course, God not only command that men need to work, but He also commanded that we should rest. Okay, so work and rest are both commanded by God. Now, in the light of this, our goal is to approach our work with the spirit of excellence. Why? Because if our work comes from God, then how many of you will agree? Our God deserves our very best, my utmost for His highest. See, and that is why we work with the spirit of excellence. We give everything we have. We do our work well because it, it is done as unto the Lord. In fact, do you realize that God Himself works? God Himself is a worker. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, listen to this. By the seventh day, God has finished the work 
that he has been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and make it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he has done. It was only after sin came into the world that work degenerated into toil. You see, and in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, this is what we read. To Adam, after man fell into sin, then listen to what God said to Adam. He said to Adam, because you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now, just to be clear, the problem is not that Adam listened to his wife. Okay, it's not, it's not that, but that he ate from the tree that God commanded he must not eat of it. And because of that, cursed is the ground because of you. Now through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the fruit, the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return." See, prior to the fall of man into sin, creation was in perfect order. And I have a feeling that during that time, there was no thorns, no thistles, there was no weeds. And Adam, all he needed to do was to plant, and then there will be a crop that comes up, and he eats of the land. It was as simple as that. But when man fell into sin, all of creation fell as well. And from that point on, we now have thorns, thistles, we have weeds, we have all these things. And now by the sweat of our brow, man will have to eat from the land. Death, and therefore, work degenerated into toil because of the fall of man. Now, before that, you need to understand that work is a part of the image of God in us. Our work should give us a sense of fulfillment and significance. And it should enhance the image of God in us. And if our work is from God, then we want to do it with the right attitude. The good news I have for you is this. When Jesus died on the cross, He did not just redeem man spiritually, but He also redeemed all of creation. See, and today, he, our work has been redeemed by the Lord as well. And so if our work now comes from God, then we want to do it with the right attitude. And if we do our work well, promotion will come from the Lord, not by our own strivings. You see, I think there are two ways in which man can get to the top. One is by focusing on excelling for God, or we will end up having to strive through our own self-effort. And I'm, I'm glad that we know that work is a divine command. And therefore, if our work comes from God, is commanded by God, then let's do it with all of our heart. Let's do it with excellence. And with that will come promotion. So that's number one. If you ask me, why do I work? Number one, work is a command from God. And therefore, I do it with a spirit of excellence. Number two, my work is a means to my personal growth. Your work is a means to your personal growth. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who loved Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn amongst many brothers. God's goal, God's desire for all of us is to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And how many of you know, God often used our work and our work situations to actually mow us. Now, have you noticed that it is easy to be happy in church on Sunday? It is only on Monday when you go back to your workplaces, that's when your blood pressure goes up and all your horns begin to grow out. And it is our work situation where we have to deal with people problems, authority issues, temptation, greed, etc. And as Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So my challenge to you, my friends, is this, that when we face difficult situations in our workplaces, instead of immediately thinking, how do I get out of this place? You should consider what the Lord may be saying and which area is the Lord putting His finger on in our life? 
Is God trying to teach us through those adverse circumstances at work to actually transform us? Our work is a means to our personal transformation. Here's number three, very importantly. Why do I work? Because work is a platform for ministry. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, uh, Jesus tells us that we are to be salt and light in this world. Now, if we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see God and then glorify Him in heaven. Now, let me ask you, where is salt and light supposed to function? Surely, it must be where the pre-believers are, which means what? In the marketplaces of the world. And therefore, our work is really a platform for us to function as salt and light in this world. Your work takes you to places where your pastors cannot go. Do you realize that your work puts you in touch with people that your pastors may never meet? And many believers have this misconception, you know, that God is only pleased when we all quit our jobs and we all go into the full-time Christian ministry. That may not be. The truth is this. God is only pleased when we are doing what He wants us to do, whether it is repairing shoes or whether it's preaching to thousands. And if God has called you to be a full-time Christian worker, then I will say to you, don't be a doctor. But if God did not call you into the full-time ministry, then please don't come because you might mess us up. You know? So I think the, the, the key is not whether you are full-time or part-time or overtime. The important thing is to be where God has called us, whether it's in the church or in the marketplace. You know, there's this great movie called Chariots of Fire. I'm sure some of, you, some of you may have seen it. It tells the story of Eric Liddell, the Olympic runner from Scotland in the 1930s. It's a great story about how Eric was about to answer his call to be a missionary in China. But before he actually answered his call to go to China, Eric wanted to run in the Olympic Games and, um, that, because that was his passion. And in one dramatic scene, his sister was actually questioning Eric, why do you want to run in the Olympics when you are supposed to be going to China already to answer uh, such a high call? And Eric turned to her, put his hands on, his, on her shoulders, and then said this. He said, Jenny, Jenny, God has called me to China, but he has also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. I like that. God has called me to China, but He also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And that's the point, isn't it? It's not whether you are full-time, part-time or overtime. The question really is this, do you feel God's pleasure in what you are doing? And in the New Testament, there isn't this dichotomy between spiritual and secular work. And we must understand that every one of us are called to a common ministry of reconciliation, which is the ministry to reconcile lost humanity to a loving God. And we find this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 20. All this is from God, Paul said, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God is making his appeal through us. So we implore you, we, we appeal to you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Brothers and sisters, every one of us here share the sa this same ministry of reconciliation. It's just that we all play different roles and functions. Now, there are some of us, like myself, Pastor Jeff, we are called to be equippers. According to Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13, we are called to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But what is our job? Our job is to equip all of you, the rest of us who are called to the front line of the marketplace to evangelize and to disciple. And our job as equippers is to equip the church so that all of you can become effective ministers for Christ, carrying out the ministry of reconciliation wherever God has planted you. So, I am a pulpit minister. 
you are a marketplace minister. My pulpit happens to be in a church building. Your pulpit is in your workplace. But all of us, myself, you, we are all full-time servants of the living God. In fact, in some sense, all of us are ordained as ministers, right? Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. The only difference between you and me or Pastor Jeff, the only difference is this, is the way that God funds our ministry. I am funded by the tithes and offerings of the people. You are funded by the fruits of your labor. You are funded by the job that God has blessed you with. But in both cases, whether it's you or me, God is our provider. See, and by the way, even, even though I'm paid by my church, my church is not my provider. God is my provider. You could be paid by IBM or Microsoft, but Microsoft and IBM is not your provider. God is your provider. You see, and I think it's important to understand that or else we become too beholden to our employers. But really, God is our provider. And whether you're a pastor or a plumber, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 applies to us. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says, If anyone, that includes all of us, does not provide for his relatives and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So whether you are a pastor or a plumber, we provide for our families as God provides for us. The real test is, is not the nature of our work. The real test is our focus. That's the test, our focus. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus tells us of what our focus should be. He said this, Seek ye first and foremost the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So whether you work in a church or you work in a marketplace, you work in a bank or an office, the test is this. 2 Corinthians 4.18 We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, and what is unseen is eternal. So the question I have for all of us today, beyond our pay grade, is this. Is our focus on things eternal or on things temporal? Are you and I working purely for earthly gains? Or do we recognize that God has planted us in that office, that clinic, that school, that factory for the eternal purpose of bringing God's love and presence into the hearts of lost humanity? So whether you are a pastor, a lawyer, a doctor or a mechanic, the question remains, what is the focus of our hearts? Is it on things temporal or is it on things eternal? Now, Let's say, for example, if you were to ask me today, you know, Pastor Benny, why are you preaching today? Why, why are you speaking to us? And then my answer to you is, oh, it's so that I could get the honorarium that your church will give me at the end of this session. Then what is your first thought? Your first thought will be, huh, something wrong with this pastor. And what has happened? Even though the work that I'm doing can be as sacred as preaching, it is defiled. Why? Because my focus it's not on what the Word of God can do to people and that's why I'm preaching it, but instead I'm focused on, the, on, on, on the, the, what I can get out of it, the honorarium or whatever. Then, how many of you know I missed the point? So here's my point, right? The secular can become spiritual when the focus is eternal. But the spiritual, something as sacred as preaching, can become secular when the focus is temporal. So you could be a lawyer and you could be making lot of, lots of money uh, in lawyering. But if I ask you, why are you a lawyer? And you said that it's, it's not just about the money. I'm here because I believe I serve a God of justice and I want to uphold justice in society. Then guess what? You, your focus is no longer temporal on the big paycheck that you can get at the end of the month. Your focus is now on something eternal, who God is and what has called, God has called you to do. Therefore, my friends, it is not the fruit of your labor, but it is the focus that really matters. And you know what, friends? Your pulpit 
is your workplace. Your congregation is your workmates and your work is your platform for your ministry. And in the light of this truth, if our work is divorced from our witness, then I think we are missing the point. So number one, why do I work? Because work is a command from God and therefore I do it with a spirit of excellence. Number two, my work is a means to my own personal growth, which is why I do not just quickly run away, but I allow my work situation to help me make discipleship decisions. And as a result, I grow as a believer, as a disciple. And thirdly, my work is a platform for ministry. My work put me in touch with people my pastors will never meet. It put you in places your pastors can never go. And lastly, with this, our work is a vehicle to transform society. Why do I work? It's because I recognize that my work can be a vehicle to transform society. You know, for society to be transformed, the different arenas of the marketplace, including finance, commerce, education, entertainment, government, media, they need to be reclaimed. And the good news is they are already redeemed by Christ on the cross, but they must now be reclaimed for Christ by all of us. And it is our work that will take us into this arena of society to engage the forces of darkness at work in those places. And therefore, we go to work not just to get a paycheck, but we are there to be sought and light to transform the marketplace for Jesus Christ. Now, you may ask, Pastor Benny, is it wrong then to have ambition in the light of these biblical reasons for working? Is it wrong then to have ambition? Now, I think that this world can be made up of three kinds of people. On one end of the pendulum will be the overachievers, people who are workaholics that can't stop working because they want more and more and more. They want to go higher and higher and higher. They are overachievers. But on the other end of the pendulum, you have the underachievers who, who just will not improve themselves. They just, enough is enough, I'm taking it easy. They are complacent. So on one end of the spectrum, you become contentious. But on the other hand, you become complacent. But what we need is somewhere in the middle. You are not an overachiever. You are not an underachiever. You are a God achiever. You are there because you recognize that God has placed you there. So to me, ambition is neither right nor wrong. I think ambition is simply a part of our nature, that our God-given nature. Uh, it's part of the appetite that is deposited in man by God. For example, like hunger uh, is deposited in us. Uh, desire, passions, these are things that God deposits in us. But how many of you know, uncontrolled hunger, even though hunger is a valid appetite, but uncontrolled hunger can become gluttony. Uncontrolled desires can become an addiction. Uncontrolled passion can actually become lust. Now, in the same way, uncontrolled ambition can become drivenness. We become driven people. And the Bible also talks about ambition, but always in the context of godly desires. Let me read for you some examples of this. Right? In 1 Thessalonians 4.11, Paul says, Make it your ambition. You see the word there? Ambition. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. So yes, it's okay to have ambition, but for the right things. See, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul tell us what his ambition is. But this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on. You see, all these are words of effort, right? I strive, uh, I strain, I press on towards the prize for which God had called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Again, it is about what you are going for. See, it's not ambition itself is not wrong, but for what? See, Romans 15, verse 20, listen to Paul's ambition. He said, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on another man's foundation. 
So again and again, when it comes to ambition, the focus is always on two things. The what and the why. The what. Is this a right goal? And the why. Is my motive pure? So it is not wrong to have ambition, but the question is this. Is your ambition self-centered or is it God-centered? Is your ambition motivated by godly desires or just personal gains? Is your ambition aligned to the purposes of God? Now, this is where, before I finish, I want to, we need to talk about career versus a calling. Okay? I think there are three things here. There is a job, there is a career, and then there is a calling. So, listen to me. Most people have a job. Many may have a career, but only some are pursuing a calling. What's the difference? A job is what you have to do. A career is what you want to do. And a calling is what you were meant to do. Can you get that? See, a job is what you had to do. A career is what you want to do. And a calling is what you were meant to do. So you look at this chart now. Between a career and a calling, what's the difference? When it comes to a career, you decide, right? You decide what you want to do. And, and to turn your job, just get a paycheck, you turn it into a career because you recognize that it's, your job is a, it's a calling from God. It's a gift from God. And therefore, it's a command from God. Therefore, you do it well. And when you do your job well, you can build a career out of it, right? A career is what you decide, but a calling is something you discover. A career is, can be driven by ambition, but a calling is driven by a mission. A career is something that you can do. A calling is something that you must do. A career can be done. You can build a career out of natural talents, but you can only build a calling out of spiritual anointing. A career is something that you are paid to do, but a calling is something you were made to do. You are wired to do this. In a career, our focus is to please our boss, but in a calling, our purpose is to please our God. In a career, you are trying to advance the company, but in a calling, you're advancing the kingdom. Uh, when it comes to a career, you, you derive lots of earthly benefits out of it. Many people have built a really good life for themselves by having a great career, but a calling will reap you eternal rewards. A career is a platform, but a calling is a purpose. You see, and our careers can change along the way, but our calling never change. Now, you think about it in terms of biblical characters like Jesus, right? Our Lord Jesus, what is his career? He's a carpenter. But what is his calling? It's to be a saviour of the world. The apostle Peter was a fisherman. That's his career. But his calling was to be a pastor. Uh, Paul was a tent maker. That's his career. But his calling was to be an apostle. And you and I will begin to live missional lives when we are willing, listen carefully, don't miss this, right? We can only say that we are living missionally when we are willing to leverage our careers to serve our calling. See, and our calling is aligned to our personal passions and wirings and spiritual giftings. And our calling is never divorced from the great commandment to love God and the great commission to love people. You see? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. This is given to all of us, whether you are a plumber or a pastor. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe or to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So my challenge to you, my brothers and sisters in Hope Church, Let's use our platform to fulfill God's purpose. Our career is really our platform, but our calling is to be sought and light, to carry out the ministry of reconciliation wherever God has planted us. You know, your occupation may be a doctor, a lawyer, a student, you know, a, 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 an engineer, but your preoccupation must be the kingdom of God. And biblically speaking, if we do not leverage our career to become a platform to advance the kingdom of God, then it remains a job. And I would hesitate to call it a calling. 
It may be a great career that bring that buys you a, a good life, but I would hesitate to call it a calling if we are not leveraging our career for kingdom advancement. So here's the thing. We have a job until we discover our calling. And our calling then informs our career, which helps determine what kind of jobs we should actually engage in. So let me end with this. Here are four biblical reasons to work. Beyond a pay grade, beyond a paycheck, why do I work? Which is because work is a divine command. And because my work comes from the Lord, it's commanded by God, I want to do it with all my heart. I do it with excellence because my work is a command from God. Number two, my work is a means to my personal growth. It helps me make discipleship decisions in the marketplace. And through that, I grow and I become a witness for Christ. My work is a platform for ministry. My work takes me to places my pastors can never go. It put me in touch with people my pastors will never meet. And where I am is my pulpit. And there I, sh I carry out my ministry of reconciliation. And my work is a vehicle to transform society. And I believe that if we do our jobs well, it will become a career. And then we leverage our career for kingdom advancement and it becomes our calling. You know, God has called each one of us to our vocation. Now He wants all of us to bring His presence into our vocation so that our work can become a platform where He can demonstrate His power in the marketplaces of the world. You know, Satan wants us to believe that we only work to make a living. He wants us to reduce our work to just a means to a paycheck, to material things. But Jesus already redeemed our work on the cross and now we are called to reclaim it for His glory. Satan wants to rob us of our calling, but we know that we know we are called to transform the marketplaces of this world. After all, you know, the Hebrew word for work is avoda, which is actually rooted in a word for worship. In other words, my work is my worship. My work is my witness. Now, can you picture this? When you go back to work on Monday morning, you do your work now as unto the Lord. You now know why you are working. Do your work as unto the Lord from Monday to Friday. So as you are doing your accounts, serving your customers, cooking your dish, submitting a stock report, etc., picture those work rising to the throne of God as worship because my work is my worship. Can you see this happening all across our city? If every believer knows that our work, we do it as unto the Lord and it rises as worship unto the throne of God. And then you know what, brothers and sisters, all across the city, worship is rising to the throne of God from 9 to 5. And then the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises, the worship of His people. Do you know this word inhabit literally can be translated as sit on. So as we do our work as unto the Lord, as worship unto God, we are building a throne for God to come and sit on our city. And how many of you know where God sits, He rules. And therefore, don't be surprised that we begin to see miracles, signs and wonders happening in the marketplaces of the world. And then before you know it, transformation comes. Oh, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Word of the Living God renovate our minds and bring a fresh paradigm into our work. So whether you are a student, a housewife, a plumber, an accountant, or a salesman, or a pastor, I want you to know this. God wants to transform your workplaces. The question this morning is this. Will you surrender your work to Him? And say, God, I place my career, I place my work before you and I consecrate it, and I use it, I leverage it for the advancement of your kingdom. If you would do that, we will begin to see God work in our marketplaces all across this world. And you will realize that your work is more than just a paycheck. It is beyond your pay grade. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you come and renovate our minds 
so that we begin to understand biblically and begin to see our work, not culturally but biblically, begin to develop a worldview for our work that will take us beyond just our pay grade and just a paycheck. But you take us to the place where our work will become our witness, our work becomes our worship, where our, we recognize that our work is a command from God. It's a platform for our ministry. It is a means to our transformation, a vehicle to transform society. So come and do that in all of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.